What's up, everybody? Here's my new friend, David. Who are you? What do you do? Uh, well, I'm David. I'm an archaeologist or anthropologist. I study ancient humans and dogs. Yeah. Yeah, it's dope. And you have your own, you have your own dog, Strider, who's uh, yeah. very sweet. Um, so how did you get into all this? You've done TED. Uh, I'm on the Wikipedia page for Ethnosynology. There's only two people on it mentioned, and it's uh, this guy, Brian Cummins, and it's you. So, I, you know, how'd you get, how'd you get okay. into doing this? <laughs> um, well, I guess always liked history and anthropology as a kid. I uh, went to school for history and then learned, like, all right, you can't really do anything with that. It's just a lot of reading. <laughs> Um, and then I took an anthro class and was like, okay, this is human evolution. This is archaeology. And this is like, uh, like, you know, studying human cultures and stuff. So I was like, all right, this is what I want to do. So I ended up studying that transferred schools. And then I was taking a class and learned like about this lady that was buried with a dog burial or like three with this puppy. And I was like, oh shit. Right. Like people had dogs way back then. And that just kind of like clicked with me. And I just always like, when I would read a book about like ancient people, I'd like look for the dog, like the index in the back and I'd look for dogs and like try to read about that. And I just got obsessed with it and then found out like ethnocynology is technically the term for that. And then went from there. Yeah, that's really, you know, it's interesting. It's good to have a, it's good to have a niche, you know, and that's a, that's yeah. a cool niche to have. And people seem to really like it on your Instagram. It's at ethnocynology for people. It'll be, it'll be in the video description. Uh, yeah. And yeah. So, I, I gotta, you know, one of the things I always think about because I don't study this, but I do. I have a, I have a dog. Um, you know, where, where did the relationship start, and why did it start? Like between humans and dogs. Yes. Yeah. Not me and my dog. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, I mean, it starts between. It depends on how far back you want to go. Like, if you want to say, like, when the first like dog was made. Um, it's like we could say like 14 15 thousand years ago but like in my opinion it starts when like the first humans get into eurasia and start interacting with wolves um because that's when like wolves and humans are very similar animals in a sense and they start inter and they're hunting the same animals like reindeer and bison and they're competing in the same area for the same animals and they have to interact a lot so they're starting this like relationship where it's like wolves have to compete with humans and then, you know, face this challenge of like, okay, I can either dwindle my populations to deal with this new invasive species or figure out how to adapt. And then wolf dogs are like that adaptation. They just figured out how to scavenge around humans. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's such a cool, I mean, it's a symbiotic relationship and I guess we don't really think about it as much, especially you know, it's just weird. Like it's so many years later and we have a different society now. If you, you don't really think about it within modernity and, you know, after the Gilded Age, it's the things changed a lot. Um, yeah. So you ever, you ever see that video of, I think it was a coyote hunting with like a honey badger or something. Mm -mm. Oh, it's sick. Like, you know, and I didn't realize other animals hunt together too. Really? I've seen honey badger don't care, but I haven't seen, um, I haven't seen that one. Or maybe it was a wolverine. I don't know. I don't, I, I'm, I'm terrible with animals and that's why you're here. <laughs> sure. Like what's, what happens though? I'm curious. I think, I, so I forget which, what kind of animals they are. It's, it's a big dog, like a coyote and a wolf and like a honey badger or a wolverine. I don't know. But the, I think it's a honey badger because they're better, at, they're better at like digging and the, the dog species is better at smelling. So they work together that way. So um, when, I, when the, dog species you know sniff something in the ground the honey badger can like uh get it out and they'll share like a i don't know like a like a mole rat or something i have no idea wow. but they, yeah it's pretty interesting how you know and like there's there's fish that do similar things with like they'll eat the they'll eat the like you know the there's basically the shit that's on the other you know on the shore sure, and stuff. Sure. it's just it's just cool how things evolve together and, and like so do they do it on purpose or it's just what happens because of evolution the the working together or like yeah the, like the 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 symbiotic relationship is it like a conscious thing or is it just you know the the wolves that were nicest to the to the humans winded up just being able to hunt with them or were they thinking like hey I gotta I gotta start doing this 
Uh, it depends on like the environment or like the, the situation, but yeah, it's kind of a natural response to um, like, you know, like environmental pressure. Like it could happen as like just the whole species adaptation over time to like humans invading, or it could happen as just like one wolf in that pack. is just like, you know what, whatever, I'm just going to go scavenge. Um, it just depends, but it could have been that one wolf did it. And then like the next generation, two wolves did it. And then it just, it's a trophic cascade as it were. And it like just a domino effect of it happening. Um, but for an animal to just decide one day to work with another one, like it could, it, you know, free will comes into play. Yeah. yeah. So I guess humans don't really look at it that way. Cause it's, it's hard. Cause we're very, uh, we're very specious, you know, we think we're the only yeah. ones that uh, have a lot of the cognitive ability that we have, but crows, I think it's crows are a lot better at solving problems than us. Uh, mm -hmm. If you teach bonobos things, they can teach it, they can learn it a lot faster than humans can. Yeah, like their Often, memory is just insane. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What's the, I don't know the name of it, but they have like the button things the bonobos can use to talk to each other. Um, it's in like, I think it's a, the Kyoto lab or something like that. And they just like can memorize the numbers on the screen way faster than we can. Yeah. It's wild. Have you seen, um, I mean, Joe Rogan talks about this all the time. Yeah. All uh, the time. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> like, Ch chimps uh, pe people think chimps are going through a stone age there's chimps that are performing rituals now they're throwing rocks at trees and i don't know it just it's crazy because we're actually getting the better we get at science we get a better glimpse of how similar we are to everything else we think we're so different from yeah yeah um i would definitely agree that like what whether it's that they're doing it on their own i don't know or whether it's that they're copying us um that apes are definitely like in some kind of like transitional period into, you know, a stone age or like some kind of revolution. Um, whether that's because of the pressures of us just exerting upon them, they probably have to do it or whether they would have done it on their own. Have we not been doing that? I don't know. Um, but like orangutans like are spearfishing now cause they, they've seen us do it. Um, they also like take leaves and scoop water out to drink out of it too. Cause they've seen us do it too. So like, that's tool use for sure. That's um, fucking wild. Yeah, man, it's cool. <laughs> there's a, yeah, there's also those chimps and they stab. I think they stab ant hills or something like that. I yeah, they know. just like take the stick and put it in the ant, like the termite mound and eat them. Yeah, that's tools. Wild dude, they're making some. They're making bug churros. That's insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It is. It's like scary, but like realistically, we don't have to worry about it because that's like millions of years ahead of time when they figured out more shit right right yeah um there's also experiments with um i want to say it was kanzi the bonobo um and maybe kanzi's son or i don't remember uh anyway another bonobo around there but uh teaching him how to make stone tools to cut rope and like the rope was basically holding up a box or uh, like the rope opened up a box that had a tree in it right so like he knew that, okay, if I break this rock, get the sharp knife out of it, cut the rope, I'll get the treat. So, like, he knew, like, the cause and effect of it, and he needed to make the tool to get the treat. And, like, he could do it. But, like, would they be able to make it on their own to make that choice? No. But if you taught them to do it, yeah. So, it's, like, they have the capacity. It's just, can they do it on their own? Like, it just depends. So, like, that million years of, like, evolution to, like, come to that conclusion, we've already done, but they're in the middle of that. So it's cool. right. That yeah. is so cool. So I, I always think about this. Aren't humans just like highly evolved fish? I mean, yeah, we all are. <laughs> like, Isn't that so weird? <laughs> yeah. Everything like I think of things in like this weird. We share 50% of our DNA with a banana, right? So we share like 70% of our DNA with a, a, a fly. And then we share 90% of our DNA with a chimp. So like I th was fish fall somewhere like between a chimp and a, a fly, you know? So yeah. it's like, it's cool. It's like life's just a spectrum from banana to us, <laughs> you know? <It's> cool. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, vegetarians out there, I'm a vegetarian myself. We're all cannibals Same. kind of in a way. Sincerely. Are... What was that? Sorry. What would you say? Sorry. I'm oh, we're all cannibals in a way. It doesn't matter if you're vegetarian or not. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> So, okay, so wolves are a lot smarter than domesticated dogs, correct? Um, 
It depends. So dogs are more socially intelligent when it comes to understanding human intelligence and human sociality, but wolves are more intelligent in terms of like being a wolf and like hunting and being a wild dog. Like it's weird. It's, it's hard to compare the two, but yes, like uh, wolves are equally as intelligent at being them. It, it's hard to compare the two. But it's yeah. it's relative, right? So it's kind mm -hmm. of like the this idea that, you know, someone might be a doctor in like Jungian archetypes, but they don't know how to drive a truck, that kind of thing. It's like, well, truck driver yeah. knows everything about driving a truck. That's a really good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So the reason I ask is because um, I really like studying philosophy and talking philosophy. And there was this guy, Rousseau, who basically came up with the idea, I mean, we still think about it now in, in modern society, that humans are domesticating themselves, kind of like how dogs were domesticated through things like phones, through just like the way we interact, cars, these big corporate cities, these giant civilizations of, you know, really we're supposed to be in civilizations of like 300 people, but it's millions now, and now it's the world, so it's billions. So do you feel like humans are kind of domesticating themselves and, and maybe not becoming a different species, but becoming something different? Um, so domesticating ourselves in the sense of, like, define domesticating. So, yeah, so like when dogs, you know, when, when, when humans and dogs work together and then, wol you know, wolves turned into like these cute, pretty much uh, permanent puppies that they are now. Like, sure. okay. yeah, um, it's like, are we, are we turning into that perpetual babies almost? I would, yeah, in that sense, I think. So, like, a, a big part of, like, domestication in animals is retaining neotenous traits. So, like, you want to keep that, like, cuteness factor. So, like, a dog is just an accentuated cute wolf. You want to keep that, like, puppiness to it. So, like, it's endearing looking and not aggressive looking. Um, and, like, if you think about humans, and if you look at anime, like, anime characters always have, like, those huge eyes. And it's, like, yeah. they're super expressive or, like... Spongebob's really good at this too, like the, the expressive faces. That's why Spongebob memes are so like popular. Um, and it's like humans are evolved to have super expressive faces. So like we're evolving to a point where like we're like past that like animalistic and we're, like we're like trying to be more like emojis, you know? So like, yeah. we're getting to this point where it's like more, um, yeah, we're just we're past like our like wild form and we're going more towards just like highly social form. And like, we're more evolved to like, we're pushing towards this way. I don't know. It's hard to explain, but like, we're, you just follow what I'm saying? Like we're, we're going yeah, I do. Like yeah. cosmetic, you know? Yes. Yeah. And we, we've had less of a, I guess the way to explain it is we've had less of a need to have more of the, um, I, I guess you could call them masculine traits, um, you know, where, you know, where we don't need as much hair because we have, you know, homes now and sure. we, like things like that. And, and we become more social. Our, um, I mean, look at, you know, the human jaw is, is an example of that. Like we, we've, our jaws have changed so much over time. Our mouths used to be so much bigger. Now we eat softer foods and we have smaller mouths. It, it just, sure. it's a slow progression and, and yeah we will we will kind of become these these like cybernetic technocratic uh beings eventually one thing i'm scared of though is we've seen with the coronavirus pandemic and everything that's happening climate change right now if this society that we've built we're still a type zero society if this all goes to shit and it turns into fallout new vegas we're screwed yeah um yeah i'd, <laughs> I'd agree uh it's like we we've lost i don't know how to explain it without being just like super depressing but we all like the survival like adaptations that we've had like you know the the ability like you're saying like the big mouths to like chew and process like raw food or like bamboo and stuff that we used to have is gone we have to have fire we don't have fur we have to have clothing and like all of that we we we're just naked we can't exist in the wild anymore like that we have to have these things so all of like society went away and like we're raising a generation right now that like is only interconnected with cell phones and like social media like that's how they know how to form relationships like 
that's kind of like in the group dynamic of like growing up in like a tribal society is gone. It's just weird. Like humans that are now, if that was gone, it's just a weird scenario for a human. It's just, it would be alien to them, you know? Yeah. And, and this new society is still kind of alien to us because we're still the same species that we were. And, you know, like all this is so new compared to humanity, uh, you know, living in these giant complexes with so many people do, doing things that are so not natural, like sitting at a desk all day and being like, yes, boss, I'll get, I'll get that memo to you before you fire me or chew me out or yeah. whatever. And I mean, the fucking, our brains, like our subconscious or, or our bodies just might just, are just probably thinking, what are you doing? Just go run in the woods and hunt for a squirrel and eat it and cook it and fucking kill more animals, you know? Right. Like, yeah. yeah. And we're, we're, um, it was this really good book. I talk about it every podcast. It's called Civilized to Death by Chris Ryan. We're in okay. a zoo that we created for ourselves. Okay. In the sense of like, we've put up these like boundaries that like, I think that's what you're saying. Or unless you want to explain it more. Yeah, I'll explain it a little. I'll explain it a little more. Uh, so like you're in, a, you're in a home right now or an apartment or wherever you are. Um, but you know, we still, and I'm in I'm my room right now, and I, we both still know that this is not how humans are s supposed to live, kind of. You know, we're supposed to be nomadic. We're in the same place. Um, we're talking right now over the internet on Zoom. I'm drinking a bot, like a water out of a bottle. There's so yeah. many things that are unnatural that we know are unnatural. The way that we talk, it, even the way that we're conversing right now is very influenced by what we watched as kids. You know, it's very emoji-esque. And you know, yet we still allow ourselves to be inundated by it. So it's this idea that we're domesticating ourselves and allowing it to happen. We know social media is bad for us. We all stay on it. I mean, I can't tell you how many political philosophers are like, get off social media. And then they're posting pictures of their food. And it's like, yeah, yeah we're in a zoo of our own design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah, I would say that's like spot on. <laughs> what do you for think sure. about zoos? Um, uh, with like other animals, um, like goats and sheep and like giraffes and stuff, if it's like a humane enclosure, sure. Like if it's done well, it educates people about the animals. You get to see them. Cause like, when am I going to go to Tanzania to see, you know, but like for apes and stuff, I think it's a dilemma for me. Cause I want to see, I want people to be able to see great apes so you can see like where we came from and like how humans are so similar to animals but like also they're just technically human in a way yeah so like i don't want them to suffer and not in the wild in a place where like they know i'm in a cage so it's like a catch-22 like i want people to be able to see them so we can preserve them better but at the same time they're suffering in like you know an enclosure it's hard um, yeah, it's kind of like, yeah. I mean, it's slavery in a way. I feel like it's kind of slavery. There, there's maybe, maybe there should be eventually some sort of intelligence meter. Like if a species is like capable of, you know, has a certain EQ and IQ that they cannot be in a zoo or something. Have you heard of the mirror test? No, I mean, yes, but uh, yeah, actually explain it though. Cause I know okay. a little bit about it. I've been meaning to post about this. I need to do that soon. Um, but so the mirror test is like, it's a little outdated now and I'll explain why, but it's the idea that like, if you were to put, like, I see my glasses on my face looking at myself right now and I could be like, Oh, I got to take those off. Um, if you put a piece of paint on a chimp, they'll see it in a mirror and like play with it. If you put that on a dog, they don't see it. Um, but if you put it on an elephant, if you put it on a dolphin, if you put it on any other ape and you put it on a crow, they'll see it and they'll play with it and take it off and like want to mess with it. But other animals don't see it. So they can see themselves in a mirror and like they think therefore they are type thing. Um, dolphins will go crazy and play with it and whatnot. Um, but other animals don't see it. So therefore it's like argued they don't have self-awareness. Um, but now it's like debated that since dogs and cats don't really see so much that they don't rely on their sight as much as their smell that maybe dogs just don't really see themselves, but they smell themselves. So if you put like a dog scent on them, they smell themselves. And then they're wow. like, oh, I'm here. Yeah. So if you just like 
change the scenario a bit, it's different. So like dogs technically are self-aware when you put their scent in around the room somewhere and they're like, oh, that's mine. So it's like, oh it's my God, that's yeah. mind blowing. You're right. Cause we're so, I think too, as humans, we're so focused, especially in the West, we're so focused on, we kind of think we're this tiny man behind this windshield of our eyes. Right. So we, we see things very like, so everything's very visual to us. We don't think about, you know, other senses are just important. You know, other animals hearing themselves, other animals smell, like smelling themselves, ta- tasting themselves, yeah. feeling, them- <laughs> feeling themselves. Humans do that one a lot. But, right. uh, <laughs> you know, and, and plus there's more than five senses, like being aware of your own balance. Isn't that self-awareness? And also the thing with yeah. the Mirk test, what if the dogs just don't give a shit about, like, what if they're like, yeah, like just the way that what? they process it, you know, what if there's, I don't give a shit that there's fucking pain on my head. I, I'm a slave to a human. Exactly. That's a really good point. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, RIP Louis CK, but I think he had a, um, <laughs> a good, uh, a bit where he's talking about like the walruses at the zoo and he's like, I'm a slave. <laughs> like, I can't remember the bit, but yeah, it was great. to talk about walruses at the zoo or seals or something, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. His, you know, I wish, you know, his old stand-up, man, some of that shit. I, apparently, his new stand-up's really good, too. I've, I haven't watched it yet, but it's hard, it's hard to watch things sometimes when you know someone's done something, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I still think he was, a, he was a good artist. Right, right. You got to separate the art from the, from the person sometimes. Uh, mm-hmm. they're, two, they're two separate ent- entity, entity. I mean, even though they're the same. He's one of the greatest comics of all time, let's be honest. He might be the greatest. Yeah, I, I really liked him. I was devastated when that happened, but... Um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> do you listen to, uh, do you, do you listen to, like, uh, History Hyenas, the podcast? Dude, I recently got into them. Uh, what's his name? Uh, what's the, the main guy's name? Uh, Giannis Papas? Giannis Papas. He, like, follows me for some reason. That's how I found uh, you. Okay. Yeah, so I, like, was like, who's this guy? And I, like, followed their podcast, and it's hilarious. <laughs> Yeah, dude, yeah. they're both fucking just crazy New York kids, and I love it. They're just like, yeah. Wait, oh, yeah, you said you're from Jersey, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm in the I'm in the metro area, so I'm technically I'm in the Appalachian Mountains technically, but my my town is just makes the New York metropolitan area. So okay, sick. I'm in- <laughs> I'm from uh, Long Island, so like I'm used to all that. So cool. Oh hell yeah, dude, that's awesome. Fuck yeah, yeah. a couple of East Coast guys. I love it. I'm so happy. I mean, I'm so happy that you're from Georgia, which is still kind of East Coast, but it's South. But I'm glad you're from Long Island because it's like now I like, yeah. oh man, that's awesome, dude. That, so you grew up there for you grew up there your whole life. I grew up in Long Island until about like eighth grade, and then I moved to Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and I like to think that's what made me like an anthropologist because like just fish out of water. I was like two grades ahead of people in Tennessee, so I was like. <laughs> and like you get to just observe when you're like this is it's a culture shock so you're like got to see what's different and I just like immediately as a kid was like noticing different things about culture and it's like just made my mind different you know yeah you know people I don't really realize America itself is kind of like the the European Union like states are different cultures if you I was just in, I was just in Texas um uh with visiting my my step grandparents they're they're from ecuador uh, in houston luckily i speak a little spanish but a lot of latinos down there people are so incredibly nice like up here if you knock on someone's door they're like what the fuck are you doing get out of you yeah. and then down there just like yeah come in have some i was gonna say sauce it's, it's they don't do that down there like i'm italian but like down there they're like yeah come in have some just food or like whatever and like it's yeah. it's like scary how nice people are in the south yeah they they really are and that, that's the thing like in New York City, and like, I'm an anxious person. I think everyone is on a level, but like, you can walk by like the whole city and like no one will pay attention to you. And like, like if you fall over, someone will help you out. Like, sure. But like, if you're walking by somebody, like, you don't ever have to worry about seeing them again. And that makes me like not anxious. So that's good. Like, I don't care. But then in the South, like, people will stop and stare and just start a conversation with you. So I have to be constantly on edge. Like, fuck, I don't, don't make eye contact because then they're going to like talk to me. And then, like, that makes, like, it's just weird. But, like, in a sense, they're nicer. And, like, they'll have a pleasant conversation with you in a sense. And, like, they genuinely want to hear from you. But Yeah, and it's it's real, you know, like. Yeah. 
it, it's it's the, the America is so weird. It's like three different countries too. Like the East Coast is very like, you know, abrasive, kind of fast paced. Yeah. The middle and the south, it's like nice, how are you? And then like in the West Coast, it's like apparently very fake over there. I don't know. I haven't I haven't met a lot of people from over there, so I don't want to talk shit. But like that's kind of like the gist of what you get if you go to like LA or something. Uh, I've been to, <laughs> I've been to Southern California many times and I would say that is the uh the vibe I get. It's just very like I mean, it's gorgeous, for sure. It's just, like, super, everyone's, like, really rich. So it's just, like, uh, where I've been. But, like, yeah, it's just, but it's also, like, so nice, so pretty. And, like, I would probably be the same way. You're just, like, you're on vacation constantly. So, like, you would just act that way. <laughs> well, yeah, that's so true. You know, like, when you hang out, I mean, you moved, too. Did you Did you pick up any, did you pick up any, you're just by being, a virt- by virtue of being around, people from Nashville, like any Southern colloquialisms or like a bit of an accent or anything? Um, I don't think, I definitely, so anthropologically you pick up your accent around the people you hang out with in your preteens and teens more so than like as a kid. So having grown up on Long Island, I like kind of neutralized my accent moving there as like a teen. Um, so I didn't get, I just kind of have a neutral accent. But I definitely, like, people will say, like, I'm fixing to make a sandwich or something like that. I'm going to fix a sandwich, which I've, like, never picked up. I'll say y'all sometimes just because it's easier. Um, a super Southern thing is to say, like, I don't know. I guess it's hard to, like, figure out what you say. But I definitely have some, like, Southernisms. I don't know. I definitely love Southern food. <laughs> like, mm. That's really Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I... I... I, when I was down in Texas and I was in San Antonio, I went off my vegetarian diet for a week. And, dude, if I was around those tacos every day, bro, bro. Yeah. yeah. Tacos. Tacos are good. Good thing I'm sick of pizza because of it. But, yeah, man. <laughs> so that's got me thinking, like, people, you know, people are very different no matter where you go. Um, and obviously there's not, <laughs> I'm sure some racists would like to believe this, but there's not different re- uh, breeds of people, I don't believe. So yeah. why, why do dogs have different breeds and how is that, you know, able to happen and how is it even possible? Yeah, so all dogs are the same species, just like people are the same species, like today. There were different species of people, but um, it's like, there's regional differences between dogs for sure. But then like you can breed dogs for, since dogs only live like seven to 12, 16 years, just depends, you know, on like, how long they are. You yeah. can like, ex- like accelerate that, like their, their biology. So like Whoa. you can't do that with humans cause they live a hundred years or so, you know? So like you can make dogs and there's six of them to 12 of them in a litter. So you can just like accentuate their traits way faster and you can make their breed change. So if you want to make a dog, the way I always explain it is like, if you've seen a Greyhound or a Saluki, like the big racing dogs, yeah, um, they have like a huge chest, they're super slender and they like are aerodynamic looking. So if you take like a wolf that's really little with a fast wolf and then like times that by 30, you're going to get a, like a dog that's super slender, doesn't have hair to drag it down, has a huge chest, and is super like aerodynamic. And the huge chest helps pump all of that like blood and like has giant lungs to like, you know, make it a running machine, you know? So like, that's why you have that breed. But then from there, you can have a breed like a Border Collie, who is just like, it's a wolf. It's looking because it's still a pet in a sense but it like has all of those wolf hunting instincts that like help it run around like a sheep herd, you know, and do that thing. And it does that like where it, border collies like do that cool, I don't know, stalking thing. I don't know. So like they got a little swagger in their step. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. And you're just taking like, it's a wolf trait and you just take that trait and go wild with it. And you like, you take what you want from it. And then, from those breeds, like the original, like, you know, herding breeds or hauling breeds or running breeds, you then take those and you make like the teacup breeds or like, you know, hounds or things like that we, we have now. But Are we ever going to like make dogs, not dogs? Because you look at a Chihuahua, which is what I have, 
and you look at a Great Dane, they're like, I know they're not, but like they're different animals, you know, like are they, if we keep, if we keep, because like you said, it, I, that's, that blew my mind, the acceleration of biology, is that going to change them from being, like, dogs at some point? Um, if you were to breed those together, or if you were to keep breeding them? Keep breeding them separately. Um, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I guess you have to ask a biologist, but I do know, like, if you had a Great Dane and a Chihuahua, like, breed together, like, if the Great, if the great Dane had chihuahua puppies it would be okay i wouldn't want to wish that on the chihuahua yeah um, i think it would naturally like that line would just end so i guess yeah it would naturally either stop or it would naturally like i don't know it would just can yeah that's a good question i'm sure there's probably an easy answer to that i just don't know it yeah well maybe it's like well you did that video where you um did the interview with charles darwin and it's really it's really well made by the way and it's really cool yeah, people thanks. should go check it out um but you know maybe it's just like kind of how darwin was seeing the different birds on the galapagos you know they're separated for so long and they breed for so long who knows you know i don't know because the thing the thing is i mean that's what ethnocynology is kind of um proposing here is like a lot of anthropologists haven't didn't really look at I guess dogs for a long time because they're domestic and, and they're kind of almost they're almost perpetual in a sense so but that you know but that's why you're doing what you're doing to kind of figure you know these things out right yeah um that's the thing do you follow archaeology inc too I do not okay so that's my friend Aaron he studies like the archaeology of tattooing um so like kind of like dogs uh, or I guess I'll start with him. People weren't looking at, like they saw these like cactus needles and they saw these like bone needles in the record and thought they were just sewing needles or something like that. But he looked at them and checked out like the residue on the tips and saw that they had ink on them. So it was people like tattooing with them. And he was like, oh, so like at all of these sites, we thought it was just sewing needles. People were actually like tattooing the shit out of themselves for, like throughout <laughs> history. Um, so in that same sense, people just assumed yeah people had dogs and it wasn't really thought about until like we start seeing a lot of dog burials pop up um or like you see a dog burial or two and you're like okay they had a dog burial cool but like not until like in the past 10 15 years did people start caring about like i wonder what they were doing with the dogs at the site or like why did they have dogs or like yeah they had dogs but why did they need them or how the hell did they bring dogs to Hawaii? You know, it's like <laughs> questions like that. Yeah. yeah, which that blew my mind the other day too. I saw that. There's like a dog, there's dog remains on Hawaii and Rapa Nui, um, which means that the Polynesians would have had to have brought chickens, pigs, with them to Hawaii. Like, it's crazy. They had to plan for that. Yeah. Yeah. We, we were a lot smarter than we give ourselves credit for. So, for sure. Yeah. There's to my ancestors. Exactly. Yeah. You, you, that's so cool that your uh, your buddy found that. You have some tattoos yourself, right? Yeah, man. Um, I got this is uh Wyoming where I used to live. Oh uh, yeah. This is my first tattoo. Just like history, anthropology, and then I got Nashville on the back side, and then New York on this side. This oh, that's side. dope. That's so yeah. cool. And that's a mammoth hunt. I don't know if you can see it there. I'll stand up. Brad. Mammoth, and that's just sick. Yeah. And you, do you play guitar? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Dude, hell yeah, me too, man. What do you like? What kind of music do you like? Uh, man, I kind of like everything. Um, I started, got really into reggae in high school. Um, <laughs> that's kind of how I learned guitar because it's just like easy chords to pick up. But um, someone smoked pot sophomore year. I did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, I played. A lot of Hendrix and stuff. I don't know. I play. I play anything really. But yeah, I just um, I just talked to Chris White from like I interviewed him from the Zombies. If you know that band, like they do, she's not there. Time of the season from the '60s. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, and well, the, his episode will be out after this one. So, but he was just saying like, you just got to be creative and uh, like Giannis Papa says from History High in his life is a farmer's market of ideas. So that's how I am musically too. Like. You just, you know, you like what you like. People, I think, want to, people want to, like, define you or whoever you are just by, like, no, you, you should be a rocker or this or that. And 
you know, who cares? Just make whatever you want and just do whatever yeah. you want, right? And I always tell people, like, if you were to look up my, like, most recently played, it's probably, like, the Lord of the Rings soundtrack. So, like, I don't care. Like, it's just, it's whatever I listen to. <laughs> like, <laughs> so you like, uh, um, you like dogs and kind of stories and media too, right? I think you just put something up about that. Yeah. Um, I just really like film and TV. Um, I almost went to film school after grad school because I just wanted to, like, make, like, with the Darwin thing, like, start filming stuff. Um, but, like, yeah, I really like thinking about film analysis. And then I thought about it. And, like, there's a lot of dogs in movies that are, like, and, like, uh, how to put this lightly. Like, dogs are used in movies as a way to, like, it either advance the plot or, like, used as, a, like, a way to fill the plot, either in a good or a bad way. Like, they're used in a shitty way or, like, they're done well. So, like, I've been kind of watching movies and thinking about, okay, is this done well or is this done bad? Um, and I've been kind of pouring through and doing that right now. So, like, with Lost, I think it was done well. I Am Legend, it was done super well. Oh, I was just thinking that, yeah. Yeah, um, I think next one I'm going to do is, like, Mad Max 2. There's, like, a dog in that. Um, like, in that one, the dog doesn't really help the plot in any way other than it just looks cool. Um, but then, yeah, I don't know. Is that what you were asking? Yeah, I don't know. I say, yeah, I just want to talk about, like, movies and dogs. What, you big, uh, big Milo and Otis guy? Who's that? Oh, it's just this, like, old movie about a cat and a dog and their friends. You ever see Homeward Bound? It's kind of yeah, like that. Yeah, okay. Homeward Bound is one of the best, I feel like, best dog movies ever. I haven't seen it in a long time. Maybe I'll watch that one soon. Bro, that shit is so fucking good. But what's your... Bad. Huh? I remember it being kind of sad, right? Because the dogs are lost? Yeah, yeah, the dogs are yeah. lost, and I think there's one cat with them. What's your favorite representation of, of dog in, in media? Ooh. Um, probably... Probably I Am Legend, I think. Cause just because, like, the sadness of it, you're like, ooh, was not expecting that. Oh, um, my God. <laughs> yeah, that was good. Um, I don't know. If I think of, Alpha was really good. I, I, I dug that movie. Um, I don't know Alpha. It's, like, a, it's a prehistoric movie where, like, the guy, like, finds a wolf and it, like, becomes a dog or whatever. It's, like, not right, but it's good. I don't know. I haven't really thought about that. That's a good question. Remember that show? When? How old are you? Uh, 28. Okay, so you, you might know the show, too, because I'm 24. Do um, yeah. you remember that show when we were kids? I think it might have been on Disney or uh, Nickelodeon, and it was called 100 Good Deeds, and there was a bully, and he got turned into a dog, and the kid he was bullying had to do 100 Good Deeds to get the bully turned back into a human. Was that like a Disney Channel original movie or something? It was like, it was a series. It was, it was a series, but it was very in that vein of, you know, a okay. kid turning into a mermaid or a leprechaun or whatever. It sounds vaguely familiar, like, but I don't remember it though. Ah, all good, brother. So what kind of stuff are you working on right now? Um, we'll see. I'm uh, currently working on a YouTube video from my friend, uh, Stefan Milo. He's a YouTuber. Uh, doing that and then i have like a slew of youtube videos for my channel that i like i don't have anything on it right now but i'm about to pump stuff onto it um doing that and then i have i'm starting my own podcast for uh um getting all that stuff in order and yeah just a bunch more posts on here i think too Working yeah and you on. don't you um because it cut out for a bit don't you already have a podcast all life and all life and ruin yeah, Life in Ruins. That's with uh, two of my friends that are also archaeologists. And we just interview like archaeologists and anthropologists in the field and ask them about their research and stuff. Have you ever uh, talked to, what's that guy's name, Trevor Valle or Trevor Vale? He's like the big dinosaur guy. No, I haven't talked to him. Oh, we, should, we had one paleontologist on there. I, should, I can get him on, though. Yeah, dinosaurs, uh, dinosaurs are weird because it's like, Birds are dinosaurs, like not even not even in the same sense that you know bugs are crustaceans or like we're fish or whatever. Like birds are dinosaurs. It's just so it's so weird because we're kind of bred with the stereotype that dinosaurs are always supposed to be these giant killers, and then like a chicken is the closest relative to a T Rex. 
Sure. And that's the thing, man. Like, if you ever watch, like, a turkey or a chicken walk and they do that, like, weird, like, head thing. Yeah. Like, if you think about a T-Rex or a Velociraptor walking, like, that's, like, what it was doing. And that freaks me out more. <laughs> They're just doing that, yeah. like, weird, weird thing. Like, I don't, I don't yeah, know. and, like, dinosaurs probably had, like, feathers, right? I think so. Yeah. At least yeah. towards the end. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, that's so weird that there was just giant chickens walking around. I mean... Would have been a lot of meat. R.I.P. to, you know, not being able to have that, but that would have been a that would have been a lot of chicken nuggets. Would have been. Yeah, and sure. I'm glad you mentioned the crustacean thing too, because like I crabs and lobsters freak me out because it's just like it's like eating a spider. Like I can't yeah, do it. <laughs> it's fucking disgusting. I see people yeah. eating them and I'm like, do you know that this is actually literally that is a bug? What you are eating is it's a bug. It's an armored spider. I'm not eating it. <laughs> yeah, you're you're eating something that you freak out when you see it when it's smaller. So you're gonna fucking break its <laughs> leg, look at its little eyes, rip it open, and just suck suck on its fucking legs like a cock when it's bigger. Like, what are you doing? Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's it. I can't do it. If it's on sushi and I don't know that's crab, fine. Right. I'm cracking it open and I can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I I can't even eat. Dude, I can't even eat fish if it looks like a fish still. You know, like how some people eat fish and like the eyes still on it and like the ribs yeah. are still like, you know, I'm vegetarian now, but like I hated, I hated if I turned salmon over and it still had like scales on the other side. It's like, no, I'm trying to eat mush that I can't tell as a, as a fucking animal. I want to eat something that looks like it was just ground up and put into a shape like a dinosaur or something. <laughs> those dinosaur nuggets, man. I miss those. Dude, I never, I never, I don't know. My mom would like never let me have them. The closest thing I had is I had those Lego Eggo waffles, but that was about it. Oh, okay. So they made, they made dinosaur shaped ones? Oh no, they made Lego Eggo waffles, like Legos. Oh. You could stack them shits. That's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. So David, you've been a great guest on the show. Um, I love talking to you. I love what you cover. I think it's a, I think ethnocynology needs to be talked about more because it's so important to our lives and we don't even think about it um where can people find you i want you to be able to plug everything you want right now social media the podcast coming up the youtube show blah, 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 blah. anything this is your time take as much time as you like sure um so at ethnocynology it's my instagram um let's see how and why productions so it's how h-o-w-e is my last name is my youtube channel um that it's got nothing on it right now but it'll be i'll pop stuff on it soon it's got a few videos right now uh and then my podcast is at a life in ruins um or a life in ruins podcast sorry and then yeah my podcast will be at ethnosynology as well so it'll be on my instagram but perfect man and um oh i wanted to ask you too i forgot when your when your ted videos got like 1.6 million views like how is how is seeing that how does that feel uh yeah that's <laughs> Pretty cool, man. I just sent them like an email saying like, hey, you guys don't have anything about like the dog domestication story. So like, do you want one? And they were like, sure. So I just wrote it to them and then it was up there. It's kind of cool. Sick. I mean, did it help? Did it help you grow your audience a lot? I think so. Definitely. Like when I email people now and it says like Ted educator at the bottom, like it definitely gives you like clout. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, dude, the, the Wikipedia page, it says, there's only three paragraphs and the bottom one says the science of ethnosynology has recently been popularized by anthropologist David Ian Howe via an informative Instagram photo blog. I mean, did you write this? No, my mom probably did. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're the top ethnosynologist out there right now. I appreciate you coming on. It means a lot to me that we got to teach it. people things before. <laughs> <laughs> Before we sign off, I ask every guest to say the same thing. Um, you know, please suggest a book or a quote that you really love. A book? Okay, a book that I really love is The Fifth Beginning uh, by Robert Kelly. Um, really good book. Uh, if you're inter like new to anthropology, archaeology, you can read it in like two hours. It's just Fifth Beginning. Check that out. Um, and then a quote. Hmm. I guess Charles Darwin, like a man's friends are like his best measure of his worth, I'd say. And dog is a man best man's best friend. See yeah. you later. <laughs> See you later, Take everybody. Care. Bye.
See ya.